Hey, everybody. This is uh, Roger Marandino from GZ Lures and Tackle. And um, we have a really cool uh, interview today. Um, I'm with Sam Peters um, with Re Release Marine and also with um, with Stay Stuck Hooks. And, you know, we, we've done a lot of business at GZ with um, with Fudu. And, um, you know, Sam has has his he really has something here. And we're going to just be, you know, really informal and talk a little bit about, you know, the product and where it came from and Sam's background. And, you know, all in all, I mean, it's just, you know, there's there's a handful of people in the world that really have the sickness. I'm one of them, you know, that will will go, you know, all over the world to, you know, to chase uh, Pinocchio, so to speak. Um, there's, there's giant blue marlin, black marlin, tunas, you know, it's all the same for me, at least. But um Sam's one of those individuals. So I think rather than get on the hooks really quickly, because um, we want to talk about that, but for me as a fisherman, you know, what Sam and I have talked about and Cole Miller and, you know, Jason Levine, I, I mean, we just talk fishing. We get on the phone and that's what we start talking about. And I'm like, hey, we got to handle this other stuff. So, I mean, and part of like introducing Sam, you know, I want everybody to know because that's kind of how, you know, we became friendly um, outside of the business world, but I kind of just want Sam to talk about, um, you know, his fishing background and his pedigree, because he has a lot of skins on the wall. He's been to a lot of places I've been. Um, I know we were just talking and he was just on the reef in Australia. So, you know, Sam, I mean, can, if you don't mind, just, just say, you know, Hey, where have you been? You know, what are your favorite memories? And just maybe just talk a little bit of Marlin fishing for a minute. All right. Great. Um, hey, everybody. Glad y'all are here. And, um, you know, I, I was blessed to have a father who loved to fish. And it was my actually my grandmother who literally would row a boat uh, out of the back of Tybee, would row a boat over and catch trout. And she loved to fish and my dad loved to fish. And, you know, I guess all this started when I was a very young boy. <laughs> and my father took me sail fishing. And if you can see this very well, this is my first billfish. It uh -huh. was caught in 1969 oh, sail wow. fishing out of Savannah, Georgia. And that feeling never left me. And um, I just have been crazy about bill fishing ever since. Um, my dad, we went all over the place, Ocean City, Maryland, white marlin fishing. We took our, our boat down to Destin, Florida, when there was three boats at Destin, Florida, the Shooting Star and a couple others. And um, I just loved it. I mean, I loved it. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I don't care if I was home trying to go to work or go to school. I was thinking about going fishing when I was going fishing and how. And of course that started like all of us, you know, I made it on some boats and this and that and ended up running a boat. And as I got older, I, you know, realized that I wanted to be in the sport fishing business. And, um, we started building chairs and all of that. And so that took us, that took me, I guess, or gave me opportunities to go places everywhere in the world. I don't care whether it was Midway or, I mean, I went to Los Sueños when there was literally a dirt parking lot and one fuel fuel tank and a little walking dock with the Nuco 2 and Chris Martin and, uh, and uh, Mitch Pearson. And, um, you know, it didn't matter where it was, Brazil, when Chode opened up Brazil, the Charlotte Bank, I went there. When Midway yeah. opened up, I went there. We did Venezuela. We did about everywhere you can go. Um, and I, I'm a, I love big, heavy tackle. I mean, yeah. that's my deal. Yeah. And um, I, I love it. Just love it. Well, you know, I know you have a project going you know, and, and you know about the one that we have in, in Horta Azores as well. And and it's exciting to even just talk to you about it, you know? Yeah. And I know Marty well, Marty Bates, and he's on our staff as well. And um, I don't know, take a minute, tell me about it because, hey, listen, man, it's a sickness, it's a passion, and I, I at least want to hear about it. So hope, you know, others do. 
Well, I kind of fell in love with Cape Verde when I was looking for a place to test a hook. I, I needed a I needed a very stable place that had a lot of blue marlin bites. And I also needed somebody that had been in that place for a long period of time with a tremendous amount of catch data. And I met Marty at uh, Big Rock, sitting at the bar, of course. And uh, we got to talking and I said, man, I really like this guy. So after I started working on the hook, I finally called him up and said, look, I want to book some days with you. And and uh, we started fishing together. And I mean, we hit it off like, I mean, the, like he's my long lost brother. Yeah. Um, we talk, we talk every day, text, uh, what's up, you know. So um, we've got a new boat going and I've got uh, uh, GNS, uh, Timmy, Timmy Richardson's chaser, which was the original sound machine. And we're completely redoing that. I'm going to send her over this June, late Ju July, or uh, uh, get her over there, and she'll go over there and live, and she'll be uh, in operation. Yeah, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time last year. I mean, I fished with Marty and Olaf last year in the Azores, and then at nighttime, um, you know, we would all get together at Les's place, you know, and um, – I just can't tell you how excited he is. I mean, I know you yeah. know, but like me, just telling you, and um, what a wonderful fisherman and a and a great person. You know, they both are, and um, that's kind of one of the cool things too, Sam. Is you know, those places you mentioned, some of them I've been to, and you know, you'll run into somebody, and you'll know somebody that knows somebody, and it's just such a small community, you know, which which I really enjoy because everybody kind of has, like I said, that sickness, but. Let, let's let's get on to this a little bit because um, I don't know if people know, but my background is in biomechanics. I was in, in strength coaching for many, many years, but that was my classically, you know, my trained profession. And, um, you know, here I have the hook um, that's unset, which is I did this for a reason because I look at the mobility of it. And I'm going to try and get Sam to talk here quickly you know, about, you know, what the makeup of it is, but just the leverage of it is, you know, that takes quite a bit off of the shank. So when that hook sets, regardless of, of the point, and, and here I have a conical point, um, the classic, what I would call like the Southern tuna, like the knife edge, you know, um, sorry, the knife edge here. And then, you know, I have this really cool one that I haven't used yet, but I'm excited to use um, this season. Uh, my season's more, you know, September, um, other than the tunas. And this is the uh, the Kona cut, which are all, they're all Fudu hooks. And, you know, I was on the phone, you know, yesterday, the day before with Jason Levine, you know, at Fudu and, you know, another guy that just has a tremendous pedigree and a sickness for fishing, which is, I mean, like I said, man, we could just sit there and talk all day, but to, to shorten that shank, you just shorten the lever, you know, so why that's important. And there are so many axes of rotation here that it's, it's really different than the traditional hook set that maybe has one if it breaks. So this lever is shortened. So it's less likely to pull out. Um, and with the hooks, you know, that they make today, you know, it, I, in my opinion, it's, it's just, it's, it's a better idea, but I want to try, just try and get Sam to talk about, you know, his passion for why he did this, because, you know, he's a bull fisherman. Um, and, you know, our conversations earlier, I think it was in Fort Lauderdale. And I just said, Hey man, why did you do this? Cause you've had so much success in your business. Your business is huge. And, you know, his comment was, I wanted a better hook or I wanted a hook that I wanted to improve the hookup ratio with because we've all been there when you see the the beauty and then, you know, maybe it doesn't set. I mean, I, that happened to me in Ascension Island for, during the World Cup, you know, probably five years ago, six years ago. Who knows if I had this, you know, who knows, maybe because that was a really big fish and in my opinion, maybe the winner. But yeah, Sam, can you talk about the process and, you know, just. It's, it's big. I know that. You know, we, we got really lucky and I was blessed enough to be able to fish St. Thomas 
um, a lot. We had a boat called the Dreamcatcher. My good friend Robert McCullough, who passed away a few weeks ago, um, we had this boat, and we, you know, we we would go over there for three, four weeks, and we, you know, we would be able to have 30, 40 bites, and oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, we would we would go with a double hook set. We'd go with uh, you know uh, every kind of hook set that we could imagine, and day in and day out, we we really couldn't move that needle much over 50 to 55 percent you know we might be 45 one year we might be 53 one year and it just literally frustrated me to no end because the first thing we did was think that the actual hook sets themselves there was a magic hook set and after exploiting hundreds of thousands of dollars and every kind of hook set imaginable and talking to every single captain in the world um you know, we were all in the same boat. We were all like, okay, this is 50%. And, you know, after I had exhausted the hook set issue, I kind of was sitting there one day and I had the hook in my hand and I looked at it and I said, well, you know, we've never talked about the hook. Um, and so I ordered a, a, every brand of hook, every brand of hook made, Mustad, owner, J Boo, I don't care what it was. And I put them all down on the table and I looked at them. And if you stack them all up on the table, um, cut the shanks off. Mm -hmm. The tip is no more than a quarter of an inch up or down or a quarter of an inch longer or shorter. Every single 10 odd, there would not be that much difference in between where the tip point was. And I thought to myself at that point, I'm like, okay, well, what is what is this hook doing? What, what are we doing? We're trying to hook a fish. And then I thought, well, we're trying to hook it into bone, but yet we're probably trying to hook it into skin. Mm-hmm. And when I thought through the ones that we pulled off or, you know, you've had him on 20 minutes, you got him on the leader and you pull him off. You know, I thought to myself, you know, a lot of these fish are skin hooked or hooked in the soft part of the underneath the jaw or in the top of the head. And I thought to myself, how do we catch a skin hook fish and how do we get a hook through a bill hook fish? And I had an engineer buddy that helped me, man, you know, do all my chair parts, did all my CAD, did all my testing and all that. And I, I mailed him a hook and I said, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to look at this hook and I forget fishing. And I want you to tell me, as far as the device to penetrate and go into something, what's going on? And he came back to me, and what he said to me really shocked me. And he said, well, this really isn't a very good device to stick into something. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, if you take any hook in the world, tie a piece of string to it, try to stick it in your desk. I rigged one up here just a minute ago, and I've got a typical, you know, a conical point, Fudo, great hook, tie a piece of string to it, and I try to stick it in the table. And what happens is this hook will roll literally 26 degrees to the target you're trying to stick it in. Um, and I asked him why. I said, why, why is it rolling? He said, well, it's simple. He said, the, the shank is designed to offset the pull. And I was like, okay, well, if it's rolling 25 degrees, how do we stop that? He said, well, you got to make it 42% longer. I said, well, okay, well, that's pretty damn simple. And so we made a nice long shank one, and sure enough, you pulled it at the table, and it only deflected about 8%. But that 42% longer is absolutely crucial to hook a fish. Mm-hmm. But it's horrendously horrible while fighting a fish. Okay. And, you know, I looked at him and he and I agreed with him. I said, well, what do we do? He said, well, we got to figure out how to make it long and shorten it up. And I said, bingo. Yeah. And the minute I said that, I began testing with exactly how short it needed to be and how long it needed to be and started playing with that, sticking stuff in the wall. And my wife's looking at me like I've lost my mind. And she goes, what are you doing? And I said, I've got this idea and I got to figure out how to do this. And long story short, we had the very first prototype and I actually saved this particular hook. 
this was my very first uh, hook to actually catch a fish. It was uh, made with a Spro 280 pound ball bearing swivel. Yep. And I had to use snap rings to get it together. And as you can very well see, all of these, is, is that a good picture, Raj? Oh, yeah, perfect. I mean, I see the Spro. That's that's our, yeah. that's our classic tuna uh, swivel for the Giants. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, the really hardest part of this project um, was going from having the idea. We wrote a really good utility patent that covered everything so where and i knew as a business person two things i knew that if i didn't have patent protection a major manufacturer would knock me off and i knew the other thing that if this did not move the needle 20 20 20 to 25 percent it's not worth doing mm -hmm. end of story um if it had moved the needle 10 10 points you and i wouldn't have even had this conversation and so I had to start a clip system to make it break and make it break at a certain poundage or drag. What poundage or drag that was, we had no cotton picking idea. I started with Bubba Carter in uh, in uh, <laughs> Costa Rica, and I had the drag breaking it. I had the clips breaking at eight pounds, and it wasn't enough to make the hook when it go in. And so our first trip to the fad, we jumped off all seven fish we hooked. I was crushed. I didn't know what was wrong. Bubba was looking at me like, no, this is not real good, Sam. I said, no, it's not. And I had made some engineering mistakes on my end. I had cut the short, the hook too short, and I had also not had enough poundage or drag to make it go in before it broke. So then we started playing with clips and, you know, every time I'd make a new clip, it was $2,000 for the mold, run a hundred parts, go test it, you know, go somewhere, come back. You know, second trip was almost equally as bad as the first. We caught one out of seven. So I was really, really crushed, but I got on the horn with the engineer guy and he said, listen, this is what you got to do. You know, I'm thinking we need to do this. We need to do that. You need to go to a stainless clip instead of what we had. And, we started and we made 22 different molds wow. for clips, 22. And we found out that the breaking at about 12 to 14 pounds. And, and I have a, I have a little bit of trouble with some people that want to fish this hook at like 25 and 30 and 40 pounds drag on the strike. And, you know, they tend to have a, tend to have a lower percentage because with a 42% longer hook, it goes in about 36% better. So what you would have to apply 10 pounds to now is like plying 17 pounds because of the length. Yeah. And I went with Charles Perry a few times and we had a couple of fish that we hooked all the way through the top of the mouth, out the bill. And they were small fish like, uh, you know, a uh, couple of stripies and this and that. And Paul, uh, Charles looked at me and said, you know, Sam, I didn't buy into that concept, but when I see a hook that's all the way through the bone and we only had 10 pounds of drag on it, I, I, 10 pounds is not enough to go through the roof of the mouth and out the top of the bone, yet I'm seeing picture after picture with it done. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of a long, drawn-out process, and we got the patent granted, which was really important, and that was an 18-month process. So the whole time I'm doing this and spending all this money and traveling all over the place and making these prototypes, I don't even know whether I've got a, pat, a product that I can market and sell that somebody won't knock off. But when I got the patent, I, I really buckled back down and started. And that's when we got to Marty. And Marty, the first time I got on the boat, Marty looked at me. He said, all right, show me this hook. And I showed it to him. And he literally handed it. He looked at it and he said, mate, and I'm going to use some French, mate. Fuck yeah. all. This ain't going to yeah. work over here. I'll destroy yeah. that thing this afternoon. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I know. I've fished with them. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I told him point blank. I said, Marty, you know, understand when you reduce the shank, you also have a hook that won't break because you don't have all that leverage. Yeah. And I tell people this all the time: take your tire and iron out of your car and go over there with, you know, 24 inches of leverage and tighten your lug nut. We'll yeah. saw that bad boy off at, at yeah. saw off 40% of it and yeah. go try to untighten that lug nut. You ain't going to get it off. 
And that's just a small example of leverage. Um, so, and, you know, all in all, we have a, a super long hook on that bite that goes in better than what we were used to. And then as it gets pressure applied, rotational pressure, either up, down, or backwards, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, uh, it's going to reduce that leverage and that torque. And we're seeing that. I've had Marlon Parker call me and say, hey, man, I just caught one hooked in the top of the head. I, I, I just – I would have never caught that fish at 30 pounds of drag. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, yeah, Marty and I see them, you know, all the time, hooked here in the side of the face and, you know, this and that. And we feel like we have pulled all those fish off in the past, especially on a hard fight. And um, Devin on the shoe and some other guys that are – really really good fishermen i mean devin says he won't put a lure in the water without it uh marlin fishes stay stuck hooks in all his tournaments every one he fishes bisbee hawaii um so it's really getting good and i think i think one of the one of the best stories that i like was uh, hayden bell down in australia they fish out wide on these these reefs and all and and get out about you know 10 12 miles and there was a group of guys that were all fishing together. There were four of them. And, you know, marlin bite funny. People people don't understand. They get slap happy, and they'll come up and bill slap something, or, you know, they'll eat something. And you see a good captain, a great captain, he, he'll get a teaser bite with no hook in it, and that fish will rip off 40 or 50 yards of line, and he can't get it away from him. And it has no hook in it, which means that, that fish is literally holding on to that lure head yeah. with enough strength to pull off 25 pounds of drag and a captain trying to stop him. Yeah. And so they'll grab it and, and just have it in their mouth and open their mouth. And, you know, that's part of it. I mean, you can't do anything about that. Um, but Hayden went 14 for 17 out wide pulling lures in Australia. Uh -huh. And there were four other boats around him that were less than 40%, 30%. Most of them averaged 30%. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, that's a good – and marlin fishing, having a beta site, you know, where you've got other boats around you and your percentage in relation to their percentage, that was the real beauty of Cape Verde because I knew what Zach – was doing i knew what olaf was doing i knew what sambo was doing i knew what marty was doing and if we took a season and i told marty you know he we caught the first um 10 we caught the first 10 uh fish in a row um am i still there yeah you're here yeah Raj. yeah i got you we caught the first we caught the first 10 in a row and Marty looked down at me and he said, I believe, but he originally had said, this is not going to work here. This is a piece of shit. I, if it's your trip, do, do, do what you want, but I wouldn't put that thing in the water if it was me. And I told, I asked a lot of people, if I want to give you a solid hookup percentage number that I can claim, how many blue Marlin bites do I got to have? And how many do I do I have to catch? And they said, well, if you get 100 bites, whatever that number is, I, I would take that as a good number. Mm -hmm. And that number came out to 74%. We call it 74 blue marlin out of 100 bites. Mm -hmm. And this year, I've run Marty's numbers as of yesterday, and he's 76% this year. Mm -hmm. And that's every single knockdown, every single thing. If we get a mystery bite and we don't have any chafe, we will not call that a bite. But if we get a mystery bite and it's got chafe on it, we can call it a bite. So, well, Sam, that's probably pretty long. <laughs> can you? No, no, no. The the passion is there, and that's kind of like what you and I talked about, and everybody else in in this project. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is the hook that you chose. And I don't mm -hmm. know if people know this, but, you know, Cole and, and Sam at Fudo are, are really, they're, they're really good friends, and which is a cool part of being in this. You know, you, you mm -hmm. get somebody that you never would have met before and you become friends with them based on, on this, this hobby, or like I like to call it a sickness. But I mean, these are the hooks that I use. And obviously I, I want to remind everybody that 
I mean, I can remember fishing in Panama probably in 19, I don't know, uh, 96. And mm -hmm. the first circle hooks, the big ones were coming out. You know, we were we were hooking, they were snelling them and we were we were hooking big black marlin on them. And then I remember doing the winter bluefin tuna fishery in uh North Carolina with those same hooks. So and they were big. So what I want to point out too is that the components that you have are top notch, 100 percent top notch. And you know, can you talk a little bit about your relationship? with Fudu because I mean, geez, that, that, the guy's a great fisherman as well. You know, it's funny and, and being in the chair business for 30 years, I am a, and, and don't, I, I, this is a passion or a curse, but if you <laughs> tell me this is a metal, something's made out of, I want to know exactly the ingredients in that metal. Mm -hmm. And whether it's a plastic bearing for a fighting chair, the chemicals in my paint, um, the sandpaper. I mean, I literally am asking 3M guys questions that say I've never had anybody ask me this question before. Um, so and I don't know why that is, but thank God for it, because. I say that to say this, when I looked at all the hooks on the market, every single one of them, the quality of the Fudo was far superior to anything that I saw as far as make, um, materials. Um, it just was, if you hold a photo, if you throw 15 hooks on the test, you're going to pick up the photo because it looks good. It It is made of the right materials. And, you know, the other thing with this project was if you're going to get in the hook business, being able to deliver the product to the customer is paramount. Yeah. And, you know, I worked, I worked with a couple of different hook companies early and it was quite evident to me that in big names, by the way, they weren't even close to being able to execute this or, or understood it enough to even pursue it. And, um, I, I got with Jason and Fudo, and I, it was by far, to me, the best hook. Forget stay stuck, forget what I'm doing. But if I was a fisherman, I wouldn't. I would only pull a stay. I would only pull a uh, pull a Fudo product. Period. End of story. Yeah, we had a we had a fish um, that probably everybody has kind of had, hopefully. But like last year uh, in the Azores, where the hook came across the bill, for, you know, from, you know, and just, just stayed there. It was not. And I was like, man, Les, this, this fish is tough. I don't know what's wrong with this fish. I can't, you know, and I'm with you. I mean, we, I use 19 pounds of drag in my hand, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, but it was cross hooked across the bill. I have a photo of it, but the barb, which everybody knows is, is a, and let's face it, they don't all, they're not all the same, but mm -hmm. it stuck in there. We had to take a board and bang it out. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's, you could see on the bill of the fish where it's had slid down and it found its home mm -hmm. and the barb was in there, but not much. So that hook on any other product um, would have, uh, it, it would have failed. It would have opened, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, last year in, in, you know, I'm talking about the hooks, but that's a huge component of your of your product. You know, Prince Edward Island last year with Spencer Norton, I brought a bunch up and he's like, Roger, we're straightening out these hooks on these massive tuna hits on their spreader bars. And then, you know, his empirical evidence, he comes back in field testing and it's they, they're fine. Yeah, mm -hmm. They're fine. They don't straighten them. So and I and I think I want to point out, too, is that if, if we look at everybody, does it look like a circle? And to me, it does. And like, I enjoy that inward bends because I just believe in it because, you know, putting a circle hook out there really er early, I remember long range fishing and using the owner hooks and they were just like, kind of like, a, like a J, but then it was like this and, and everybody was skeptical, but man, once it got in there, it wasn't coming out. And um, that's also, you know, a big highlight to this hook, you know, so I'm excited you know, you and I both have talked about our project in the Azores, my project with Les and Paul Skopinich and Char. 
and um, I'm going to pull them. I can't wait because this is, you know, this is my first opportunity, you know? Yeah. But, and I want to make sure everybody knows the, the original clips were, they had a small, and I don't have one here. I should have one here, but they had a small opening in the, in the beginning. And now we've largened that, that opening. And that's so you can get a pair of pliers around the outside of the outer clip and squeeze that down. Yeah. And that makes sure you get the right brake tension. Um, so that's been something that we've figured out here in the last, you know, six to eight months. So the newer clips with the bigger lips on the top side, really, really make sure you get a super good connection. And, um, it, it's been really great, man. I mean, I'm, I'm just, uh, over the moon, yeah. you know, Marlon Parker tell me, look, this is the best hook I've ever used in 40 years. I mean, what more do you want to hear? You know? Yeah. 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 I tell people, listen, it's not going to help a bad bite. No hook will, but I guarantee you it'll get you probably 20 more percent than what you, <laughs> than what you, what you were averaging. Yeah. This one got a, this one, this one got a, uh, I said, Hey Cole, man, can you send me a ruckus, a green and black? And he's like, why? I said, cause I got, I got a really big fish in, in Ghana in 2005. And I just, you know how fishermen are. And last year in the Azores, that one, that one got a really nice one, but the ruckus. Yeah. So I agree with you. Yeah. Well, we're, we're kind of, we're kind of winding down here cause the, the timer's going off, but, um, Hey, I'm excited, Sam. And, and I'm very happy for you too, because, you know, one of the things that I wanted to point out, um, and you and I had talked about this yesterday is why, and, and I know that you do have the sickness for fishing and you want to see it progress and, um, it's an innovation, right? And and they happen in every industry. Um, and you didn't need to do it. You, no. you know, you had a really, you know, you have a really successful, you know, business, you know, that's probably more than anybody could ever hope for. So I'm thankful. And with any innovation becomes somebody tries to copy you, someone tries to push it. So the patent was important and this is my hook set. And, um, you know, fish fishermen are, I mean, you never heard of fishermen, you know, trolling with their hook point down, you know, maybe some did it and now everybody does that. And, you know, talking to Marty, he's like, it gives it a better ballast. Well, that, that makes sense. You know, it gives it a better keel. So I personally, as a fisherman want to thank you, you know, because sometimes you got to stick your neck out and you did that. Yeah, there was a lot of a lot of naysaying going on, and it's really pretty cool to see some of the people that were not so sold on the concept in the beginning that are now coming around the corner and pulling them and calling for more and saying, "Hey, man, I need I need some more hooks," you know. And uh, it it's been great, and you know, I. I just literally wanted to catch more Marlin. I mean, I, yeah. I'm, I was so tired. You know, you hear the story of the guy and his son, and they're going to go charter the boat, and they got this giant Marlin on, and they pull it off, you know. And, and I mean, I listen to the radio at Big Rock every year, you know, hooked up, so-and-so, blah, 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 blah. Ah, pull the hook, lost it. You know, yeah. hooked up, so-and-so, pull the hook, lost it. And I asked Randy, Randy, uh, Ramsey, the, he does the mic. I said, Randy, do you, can you tell me, are there, do you have any numbers logged on how many fish are hooked and lost? He said, Sam, we can't count that high. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. I believe it. I mean, it happened to me, World Cup. Yeah. Yeah, it happened that Thank fast. God. Thank God mine and Marty stuck. <laughs> well, yeah, you're a winner. So, you know, but I mean, that, you know, everybody says that was a big one, but that was a big one. And, uh, Pulled all that line off, and then I reeled in a hook set <laughs> with a lure still on it. But it's but a hey, common tale. yeah, yeah, that's fishing, right? But but hey, I wanted to thank you, and it's been a pleasure. And I know we could sit here for four hours, but um, I'm sure we'll revisit on this topic. But yeah, I'm excited. Um, September, you know, I'm not sure if if I'll go to Cape Verde this year for the World Cup, but September in the Azores, I'm going to be pulling the stay stocks and. And food products, and it's it, it's it's exciting because, like you said, once you get that that beautiful fish to come up, you want it to stay on, you know, so you can see it's it. It's a lifetime, any yeah. second. 
Yeah, you just never know. And, uh, and another thing, I, I wanted to thank you and Cole and GZ because um, you guys have been just awesome to work with, and what a great job y'all have done there. Um, I mean, GZ hats everywhere, Marty GZ hat, and people just love you guys. And y'all, I like to say there's companies that get it, and there's companies that don't get it. And there's not a whole lot of difference between that. And one thing I definitely have seen and, and from talking to you and Cole is you guys flat get it. And um, that's a compliment. And I do a lot of business with a lot of people. And um, it's, it's a pleasure to have somebody that's as proactive as, as we are at release. And GC is that. All right. Well, thank you for the compliment. And um, we feel the same, you know, so hopefully <laughs> Hopefully I see your boat going right next to us at the at the World Cup, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you better man, have a big pair of binos, buddy. <laughs> yeah, well, last year I was I watched I watched the uh winning fish. The boat was right next to us on Victoria, you know, we we're on Sambo and it's within, you know, why you know that's fishing though, right? I uh, watched Manuel catch his in uh the year before that. It's about a about a half mile inside of us. Yeah, we were in the right place, but that's right. All right, my friend. Well, thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful day and um, we will talk soon, but thank you, Sam. You got it, boss. Bye-bye. See you.